really happy today to introduce Irene Miller, Holocaust survivor. She's going to talk uh, to you about um, her experiences. And uh, she will have some a book that she wrote in the back that has more detail. Um, and she will sign the book for you as well. So she told me not to talk too long because she wants to tell you about herself. <laughs> so <laughs> welcome, Irene Miller. Sorry, one of, one of the 10%, because 90% of Jewish children were killed during the Holocaust. Among the 6 million of Jews who were killed were a million and a half of children. Though I can tell you only about my survival journey, those of us fortunate to be left alive become also the voices of those who didn't live to tell their story. I was born in Warsaw, the capital of Poland. This is what I looked like when Nazis attacked Poland. My immediate family was made up of four. Here is my older sister and I. She's your age. And I'm three. And our parents. But we had a larger extended family numbering close to a hundred members. When Nazis attacked Poland, it seems to me that war so was under siege for a few weeks. Day and night, day and night bombs were falling. We lived on the top floor of an apartment building where it was the most vulnerable place because bombs were falling through the roof and the ceiling. So with the cooperation of friends who lived on the second floor, we moved in with them. But even there, it wasn't safe from the bombs. One night, a bomb fell into that apartment, exploded by the door, leaving the only way out was through the window, and that was the second floor. My father, who was a very tall man, he knocked out the window and jumped, and he said, we have to, we have to quickly follow him before the whole place gets engulfed in flames. When my turn came, I stood on the windowsill and looked down. It seemed so far down. I was so scared I wouldn't move. My mother pushed me out the window. Somehow, my father did not catch me. I fell in a pile of glass, cutting my arms and legs. When the family was down, my mother picked me up, carried me to a bomb shelter, and there she was sitting, pulling out shards of glass out of my legs. These running to bomb shelters occurred over and over, particularly at night. At some point, we lost the water. A bomb severed the water pipes, and the only way we could get drinking water is running down the street when there was still a functioning faucet. I remember where I was when Nazis entered Warsaw. I was in our own apartment. I don't remember it was the fourth or the fifth floor, but I was too high up to see the faces of the Nazi soldiers. They were filling the width of the street, 10, 15 marching abreast, but strangely, I could see the reflection of shining boots pounding and pounding the pavement. You know how long ago all this happened? Yet, there are still some sounds, some smells, some aromas to which I still react emotionally. One such sound are low rhythmic pounding on a hard surface. Another one is low flying planes. I hear those sounds and I tighten up. My parents felt that being Jewish, and my father was the leader of the labor union, the Jewish division, as such they were liberal people, they felt that they would be the first one to be persecuted when Nazis entered Warsaw. So sometimes 
during the winter of 1930-1940, they sold the lease to our apartment, hired a Polish guy to smuggle up the cross the border to the Soviet Union. On one side, Poland borders with the Soviet Union. Why to go there? Because at that time, the Nazis were not there. As you probably know, later during, later during the war, they attacked the Soviet Union as well. And why to smuggle us across? Because the borders were closed. The Soviets would not allow anyone to enter. I remember the last leg of the journey trying to cross the border. It was in the middle of the night, extremely cold. We were wearing layers and layers of clothing to keep warm and also to minimize under luggage. We were sitting inside the wagon of hay, the hay over our faces and all over our heads, and over all bed and all blankets. So should a Nazi soldier come across that wagon at night, he would not be able to see that people are in it. <coughs> at some point, this man stopped let us off in an area that was surrounded by tall trees you couldn't see what's beyond them. He said that he had crossed already the border and pointed where in the morning we were to take the train towards the city called Bialystok. We huddled up for the remainder of the night and when we woke up in the morning and left that secluded area we saw fields with thousands of people laying on the snow, leaning against bags, suitcases. This man did not take us across the border. He left us under no man's land. Of course, my parents didn't want to go back to Poland from where they were trying to escape. My mother pulled out a blanket, spread it over the snow among people. People were sitting very close, one next to another. She also pulled out a down comforter, commonly used in Europe in winter. And this place in an open field in winter became my home for about six weeks. My mother would repeat to me over and over, move, move. If you move, you are not gonna be that cold. I moved as much as I could. And when I couldn't anymore, I would crawl under the cover. At some point, my feet got frostbitten. I had open wounds, was unable to wear my shoes, so my mother tore a garment of hers, wrapped my feet in rags, and I moved around as well as I could. The only food we were able to buy was that with the peasant women from nearby villages would bring bread, boil potatoes in their skin, and sometimes and charge exorbitant prices. The only fluid we had for drinking is melting snow. There were woods in the area, and people were making fires to warm themselves and to melt the snow for drinking. Though I was a little girl, as you saw me, I remember many scenes starting with the no man's land. But from that period, two images are still vivid in my mind. I woke up one night and there was a strange man next to me under the covers. I tried to push him out, but apparently I fell asleep. And when I woke up in the morning, the man next to me was dead. People were dying from diseases, from exposure, from starvation, and now the family the peasant women were also bringing shovels for sale. And the young men buried the dead in shallow graves. The other scene, I was standing with my mother by a fire trying to warm myself. And a young woman approached holding the baby in her arms wrapped in blankets. And people assumed that she wanted to warm herself and her child. So they parted letting her come close to the fire. But as she did so, a man looked into her arms and said, lady, your baby doesn't need warming anymore. Lady was dead. 
men took the dead baby out of the mother's arms and proceeded with the Soviet soldiers were protecting the border and the crowd followed him. He laid that baby in front of one of the guards and the crowd started shouting and crying, let us in, let us in. See, we are dying one by one. And that guard didn't say a thing, just kicked the baby back into the crowd. And like all others, I am sure it was them. My parents apparently concluded that they had to take some rest by seeing people dying daily. One night, my father smuggled himself across the border. He must have surveyed the area before. And on the Soviet side, he bribed an official to give him a letter permitting the family to cross the border. But when he returned with that letter, that letter apparently said that he may take his children, but said nothing about my mother. And the guards would not let my mom go. Our parents decided that my father should take my sister and myself to safety and see what he can do thereafter to bring over mom. We walked a whole night in the forest, and for me, the pain was so extreme. The, my wounded feet were wrapped in soft bags, and the earth was frozen and hard. But eventually, we made it to the city of Yavistok. Around the city were clusters of Jews from Poland. We ended up in one such cluster, a wooded area with a lot of scattered little camps. This must have been at one time the property of a wealthy landlord, and those cabins were for his workers. No furniture of any kind. A few families on the floor in the cabin. But after being for six weeks in an open field in the winter, laying on a wooden floor with the roof over my head, I probably felt like a queen in a palace. My father had no more money left. And also travel in the Soviet Union then was forbidden. Only those who were big dignitaries or had a lot of officials would be able to get a ticket and permission to travel. So my father tried to reach the no man's land on the rooftops of trains. He was caught by the police, put in jail for a little day, for a few days, let out, and kept on doing it over and over. During all that time, when our father was gone trying to save my mom, my sister and I were left alone. Here and there, some caring person offered us a meal, but I don't remember what and how we were able to eat besides that. Eventually, our father made it to the no man's land, but by the time he got there, no one was there anymore. The Nazis came, took all the people, including my mother, put them on trains in directly to Poland and Germany. For the little girl to think that she might never see her mama again was difficult to understand and even more difficult to accept. Our father found some work in the city, was commuting daily by train. My sister and I were left alone. She became my little mama and we managed as well as we could. Days went by, weeks went by, maybe more. Nothing unusual happened. Then one day, we were standing over a basin propped up on a low stool so I could reach it as well, trying to do the family laundry. What did I know how to do the laundry? I spelled it on, on myself, I spelled it on the floor, my knuckles got bloody, my sister was angry. In the midst of all the tension, the door to our cabin opened, and our mother walked in. You can imagine my enormous joy and excitement, but also confusion. I didn't know whether she was alive. It seemed to me that she 
it's been so long since I last saw her. It took me an enormous length of time to trust that my mama will not disappear. Maybe just like she suddenly showed up one day, she will vanish. And I would wake up many times at night just to touch, is mama here? Well, we were happy now. We were together, and that was the main thing. And we were no longer hungry as we were in the no man's land. Whatever my father was earning was enough to buy food. But the joy did not last for very long. We started hearing that Soviet soldiers were coming in the middle of the night, taking away all the young men. My father then was a young man. One day, we heard rumors that our cluster of people was scheduled for such a raid. So my mother took the train to the city where dad worked to warn him not to come back until he comes, until he hears from her. But she missed the last train that night coming back to us. And that night, when my sister and I were alone, Soviet soldiers kicked in the door of the cabin station, get your stuff. And they marched us to a train station where there was a long line of cabin cars. And they would shove in as many people as they could in each of those boxes. My sister and I cried and cried that we are not going to go without our parents. And those soldiers kept on telling us lies and lies. And the platform was almost empty of people. We saw from a distance a small truck in our parents' eyes. Was I happy to see that? I didn't ask, I didn't find out how they heard about the raid, how they found transportation. All that mattered to me was they were there. And as soon as they arrived, they shoved us in in one of those box cars. So many people in each of them that there was no room for anyone to stretch themselves <coughs> on the floor. People leaning against bags, suitcases, against wall, against one another, whatever they could. There were two sliding doors that were pulled together to close the box car, and across them on the outside, a heavy metal bar to hold the doors in place. When the doors were pulled and we inside, it was so dark you could hardly see. There were no windows. This was meant for transportation of animals. The only light was that which was coming between the cracks of the boards. And when the doors were pulled, we were unable to open them. We had to wait until the soldiers decided to do so. And you never knew when they would. Once a day, soldiers walked around with buckets of soup. And everyone was given a cup of soup. On some lucky days, we got with a little piece of bread. But those lucky days were very far apart. Most of the time, a cup of soup was the food for the day. Once a day, they let everyone out under the train to relieve themselves. It doesn't take very long. You forget about the idea of privacy. You just do what you have to do. People were extremely hungry. Many were getting sick. And everyone, scared and anxious, not understanding why the soldiers picked us up, where they're taking us, and what they would do with us. We were on that train somewhere between six and eight. Additional means of transportation delivered to a labor camp in the Siberian taiga. Taiga is a dense forest covering the northern part of Russia. Our little houses were placed right against the coast. Bears would come to the door for us. At night, we heard Siberian wolves howling and we were scared. We heard stories about wolves attacking people at night that is in the dark. 
And in Siberia, in winter time, there are only about three hours of daylight, and the rest is dark like night. And in the summer, it's the reverse. Temperatures there would drop 50 and even lower below. If a bird, for some reason, did not fly away in time, it would freeze to the tree like a lump of ice. If you were outside with any part of your skin exposed, it didn't take more than a minute or two, you'd get frostbitten. We did not have clothing for that kind of climate. And everyone had to work. There was a cement factory, and some young men were sent to further clear the forest. My older sister, who was the five day 11 May born but well, had to work as well. I did not talk about my Holocaust experiences to my children. I didn't talk about it to anyone. There were people who worked with me for many years, and all they knew is that I was born in Europe. But my youngest child, Naomi, kept on asking me and asking me, and apparently I related some bits and pieces, because in her high school writing, I found reference to two situations in Siberia. There was one store, the governmental store, and rarely would you go there and find something you needed for your daily life. People would frequent the stores often just to see what do they happen to have today. But no matter what they had in store, everything was a ration. My mother sent me once to get the family's rations of bread. And bread came in big black lumpy loaves looking like mud and heavy like clay sitting on the counter, and the clerk in the store would give, in our case, for four people, a large piece, and this is a tiny, tiny little piece. And I told Naomi of my willpower to resist my desire eating the little piece because I was extremely hungry. So Naomi said, if you were hungry, how come you didn't eat it? I told her this was the bread for the whole family, and we had to wait until Mama divided and let us have it. But no sooner did I hand over the bread to my mother, she took the little piece and put it in my mouth. At some other time, when it was my birthday, my mother said, let's pretend that there is no war. What kind of a birthday? I told her a big loaf of bread and that I could eat as much of it as I want to. And I saw tears flowing down her face and I had no idea what did I do wrong to make my mama cry. We were extremely hungry. We were in Siberia somewhere between two and two and a half years. And I remember only one day I wasn't hungry. And I remember that day very well. We were given a tiny little piece of land and we planted potatoes. And my mother said, on the day we harvest the potatoes, we'll have one meal that you can eat as many potatoes as you want to. On the day we brought the potatoes from the field, the store had fresh carrots. So my mother got a herring cut it into little pieces, we baked the potato on a fire outdoor and ate it with carrots. Oh, was that good. I don't remember how many potatoes I ate, but I remember a thought that stayed with me thereafter for a very, very long time. When I grow up, maybe I'll become so lucky that I'll be rich, not a little rich, but very rich. Then I'll be able to eat potatoes every day. I thought that to eat potatoes every day, you have to be a royalty or very rich. Well, I see the one or the other, but I do eat potatoes. <laughs> I still like potatoes, but no potato 
will ever taste as good as the one in Siberia when I was so little. From Siberia, they shipped us to Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan then was the Southern Republic of the Soviet Union. Now it's an independent country. I'm sure that my parents felt that going south to a warm climate is available. But while we were very hungry in Siberia, we were almost starving to death in Uzbekistan. We were put in a very small farming community. My parents were not given any land to cultivate, and there was no way of finding work. My father walked from farmer to farmer, willing to do any kind of work in exchange for food. Once in a while, he would get a day's work, but most of the time not. And boil bread and leaves. My mother would go into the field, pick up anything that would grow wildly green, boil it, drink it first herself, if she was okay with it, she would give it to us as well. There was one period that we lived on broiled onion. Master had a good crop of onion, and in exchange for some of my mother's clothing, she got a bag of onion. We all came down with malaria. Malaria is such a devastating, violent disease. You could see someone one day, he looked fine, a day or two, a week or two later, he was good dead, born. I said, violent, I had malaria. And most of the time I was not conscious because my fever was so high. But when I was, I remember screaming and crying, my bones were breaking, my bones were breaking. No matter how many layers of blankets I had over me, I felt so extremely cold that I was shivering violently. When I recovered from malaria, I had difficulty walking. There were some Jews in, from Poland in Uzbekistan. I don't know who they were and how they were able to do it, but they established orphanages for Jewish children from Poland and would recruit not just orphans but any Jewish child from Poland. This was simply an attempt of saving the children from dying of starvation. One day a man came to our village, talked to our parents. Next day he showed up with the horse and buggy our mother told us we'll go to a place where there'll be other children. Food will be more available. And they, our parents, will visit when possible. It took us a few days on the buggy until we came to the village where the orphanage was housed. The orphanage was contained basically in one room. From one end of the wall to the other, Boards had been ripped off the floor, propped up on a stack of bricks, and girls were laying tightly on those boards, one next to the other, covered with old blankets, and their heads completely shaved. Across the room, the same arrangement with boys, their heads shaved as well. The caregivers shaved the children's heads because the sanitary conditions were horrible. I don't remember when and where I was able to take a bath or a shower. And they feared that under those conditions, the kids will come down with lice that spread diseases. And apparently lice nestle in air. But we found out very quickly that lice nestle in all kinds of other places as well, because we ended up a hundred bald-headed kids covered. And lice make your skin burn and itch so badly that you are ready to rip it off. 
I remember bleeding all over from that intense scratch. And you know the strange thing, I repeat again sometimes, how long ago that was. Not just when I talk about it, but when I think about it. My head starts itching so badly that I want to take my 10 fingers and scratch. It lasts a few minutes and then it goes away. A few months after entering the orphanage, my father died. There was an epidemic of dysentery in the village my parents lived. No physician, no pharmacy. My mother walked a whole day to another community in search of penicillin. I don't know whether she obtained it or not, but when she returned, my father was dead, buried in a communal grave. My mother didn't even know in which one. The war ended in 1945, but I stayed in the orphanage in Uzbekistan till 1946. I don't know what was the reason we were unable to return sooner, but I had no other choice but to. During all the years of the Holocaust, ex extreme hunger to the point of almost starvation was a daily part of my life. There was a lot of fear and anxiety, not knowing what will happen from day to day and not understanding what was going on. No newspaper, no radio, of course, no television then. If the adults knew something, they didn't share it with us. I assume that it was the assumption that the less children know, the better it is, but it worked the other way around. The less I knew, the more I speculated, the more I tried to assume things, yeah. And there were years of loneliness, strange, you know, you can be in a room with 100 kids, and feel very lonely if there is no one that pays special attention. But I tried to do everything possible to keep myself constructively involved. I learned to read when I was quite young myself, Polish, because Polish was my childhood language. And while in the Soviet Union, I learned to read and also to speak Russian. And I would read anything I could put my hands on in one language or the other. When possible, I attended a kind of a semi-school, but my educational opportunities during those years were extremely limited. The only place where I was expressing what I felt and what I thought was writing poetry. I was writing poetry since I was a young girl. My home in the Detroit, Metro Detroit area was hit by a tornado many, many years ago, 1975 exactly. Half of my house <coughs> ripped off and blown away and with it most of my belongings. A few years ago, I was looking for a book which I thought survived the tornado. And to my great surprise and joy, not only did I find that book, but in that book I found one notebook of my poems from the orphanage in Uzbekistan. I had a tall stack of them, tightly written, because paper was very precious. They were all destroyed in the Holocaust, but this was that. I mean in the tornado, excuse me. Uh, you can imagine how yellow the paper is with I was afraid to pick it up that it will crumble in my hand. But it didn't. And reading some of those poems now as an adult surprises me that nothing in it indicates this had been written by a child. <coughs> nothing cute, nothing funny. Just expressing longing for normalcy. How wonderful it would be to live with my family in a small room, not just a hundred kids in one room. How great it must be 
enough to be hungry. By that point, I interpreted hungry as a belly ache. So how great it must be not to walk around with a belly ache. I am sure I didn't remember how it felt not to be hungry, but I imagine. And then to attend school. I was always such a curious child, wanting to know and asking questions. And I see how it would be great to see my cousins, aunts, and uncles, and po ethically describing Poland. Poland to me was paradise on earth. But you saw I was a little kid, five feet, six years old when it all began. But when I returned to Poland with my orphanage, nothing of what I envisioned or hoped for became a reality. First of all, I spent another five years in orphanages <coughs> after the war. Anti-Semitism was still raging in Poland after the war. Quite a number of Jews had been killed by Polish people after the war, particularly in small towns. The tiny, tiny Jewish community that was left alive tried to do everything possible for us, the children who survived. The orphanage was for Jewish children, so were the caregivers, and so was my school. The school was held in one room. A handful of us kids, and the city then was Krakow, was left of various ages. That school took us once to what used to be a concentration camp, a death camp. In the display room was a tall pile of shoes, men's shoes, women's shoes, little kids' shoes, shoes of those who were sent to the gas chambers to die. There was a tall pile of hair, women who had long hair, they cut their hair before sending them to death, and they used the hair for various purposes. There were lamps with shades made of human skin. Soap made of human flesh. It took me an enormous length of time before I could take a bar of soap and not think of my aunts, uncles, and cousins. I told you that my extended family numbered close to 100 members. Not a single one of them survived the Holocaust. All of them have been killed. For my mother to continue living in Poland, she felt like living on the graveyard of her brothers and sisters. She and my older sister, who was by then married, she married a boy from the orphanage, they decided that they want to or they had to leave Poland. The only place they could go was to Israel because the Israeli government was helping Holocaust survivors who wanted to immigrate there. I did not know anything about Israel. I was extremely eager to catch up with my lost education. Within two or three academic years and one calendar year, I was like a sponge absorbing whatever I could. Though I did not live with my mother and my sister, they, they were within a distance that I could periodically take public transportation and visit them. And apparently they provided some emotional support which I needed because I did not have the courage to be left alone in Poland after they immigrated to Israel. 1950, I joined my mother to immigrate to Israel. By the way, the ruling in the orphanage was that the age of 17, I would have to leave and take care of myself. And I did not know anyone in Poland or any other place outside <coughs> those who lived in the orphanage. 
Israel was a different chapter of my life with different challenges. I did not know anyone in Israel. I did not know the language spoken in Israel, Hebrew, and I knew that I would have to su support myself, and I was pretty sure that I would have to support my mother as well because she was a sick woman. But as I survived. I don't want anyone to think or feel here is this poor woman who has such a tough life because I don't think of myself that way at all. Am I fortunate that I survived? That would be okay. But I survived and I was able to create, create a very meaningful life and significantly contribute to my community. This is what I looked like when I came to the United States. I was 21, 22 years old, something like that. I was married, had a little baby, and did not know any English at all. That was the third country I was coming without knowing the spoken language. Soviet Union without Russian, Israel without either United States without English. But fortunately, when I was young, I was picking up languages amazingly fast. It didn't take me too long. I entered the University of Cincinnati. I lived in Cincinnati for about 16, 17 years. I earned an undergraduate degree in psychology, then a master's in social psychology. And a few years later, I entered Xavier University, earned a second a master, an MBA with a major in hospital management. I had very rewarding work uh, as a healthcare executive, focusing a lot on mental health and also work with the drug addiction sector. For a year, I served on an advisory committee in Washington, D.C., a committee that read, dealt with women, children, and drug addiction. I am a retired now, which I say sometimes it means I work and I don't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> but I do things that are extremely important to me. My whole adult life, I tried to live by the Jewish ethical principle called in Hebrew, tikkun olam. Tikkun olam literally means repairing the world. Implied in it is, that we each have a responsibility to do everything we can to make this world a little better for everyone. How I do it is first of all, how I relate to people in my life, personal, professional, volunteer. I respect fully and equally every good human being. Doesn't matter what the color of their skin, their religion, where they came from, poor or rich, they are good human beings, they have my full, full respect. I contribute as much as, as I can to support organizations that work throughout the world to alleviate hunger. Hunger not only depletes your body, but it can deplete the soul. No child in the world should go hungry. When I see hungry children <coughs> in Africa, I identify with them. I see myself in them. I use my times and my skills to enrich the life of my community. As I mentioned to you, I live in the Metro Detroit area. Maybe one of those days you decide to visit us there. We have one of the three largest museums in the nation, Detroit Institute of Art. And should I meet you there, there I'll talk to you about art, not about the Holocaust. I have been a docent for over 20 years. I'm a mediator in court, which means I help people <coughs> with conflict, with legal issue resolve it, without having to appear before the judge. I'm on the board of directors of the oldest civil rights organization in the U.S. called the American Jewish Committee. But my most important thing in life, my commitment in life, is to use my Holocaust experiences to promote tolerance, diversity, to point out what can happen 
with hate and prejudice. And to also show you through my explanation how democracies fall from within. Hitler, the leader of fascism, was democratically elected and found ways through fear mongering, <coughs> through all kinds of devious ways, found a way to become the monster we know now. We have here a lot of people in this group, most of you. You will be the future leaders of this nation. It will be your responsibility to do everything you can to prevent such horrors from happening anywhere. The only way you'll be able to do it but to know how those things come about. Like Hitler, don't come on all at once. It is a process to which they gather support from people like that. It's a process that involves dehumanizing those whom you are attacking. Find people who would be willing to kill millions if they consider them equal human beings, but projecting them like monsters who will attack you, and you better attack them, yes. I have, on one of my uh, talks, a young woman stood up, a middle aged not so young, a woman stood up, <coughs> choking up with tears, telling the crowd that she is German, and she came to the United States as a teenager. And later on, when she approached her family, how it could happen that they allowed such horrible things to happen. And by the way, Germany at that time was probably one of the highest cultured country in Europe. How they allowed such horrors to happen? And she said, my family said that they were so afraid, they were even afraid of one another to say or to do anything. What happened is, if we ignore small injustices, they grow to become larger and larger and larger. And by the time Hitler became such a monster, people were afraid to do anything. They were scared to do. So to take action is not when things become so horrible, but to take action and not to be bystander this <coughs> when small injustices happen. No injustice is too small to be a bystander because it encourages those who uh, cause it to become worse and worse and worse. And I stress to that you future leaders, of course, will not just be leaders, but you will affect the nature of the countries we live in. And the most important thing to begin with is to choose leaders who represent your values. And you have amazing tools a tool that some people in the world were given their life for it, and that is the right to vote. <coughs> the right to vote. You don't know how many people in the world have died to get the right to vote. And I understand we don't have to go too far. How long has it been since the women get the right to vote? 100 years? That how much? sacrifice and what they did to achieve the right to vote. But with the privilege of voting comes the responsibility of making sure the person <coughs> you vote for reflects your values.